Okay, so thank you so much uh, for the CTR to uh, help organize and host this uh, series of workshops. Um, I am very grateful uh, to the council and also specifically to Evgeny Dingup and to Mark Trotter for initiating this uh, movement, right, to initiate this discussion on uh, how to use authentic materials in our language classes and how to use them to talk about something important as diversity, equity, and inclusion. So today, uh, um, I wanted also to thank our co-sponsors and sponsors, sponsors of this workshop. Um, I would like to thank uh, the Center, uh, Center for Russian, East European and Eurasian Studies at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, also, is the next slide? And uh, also the um, Russian and East European Institute at the Uni Indiana University and the uh, Russian and Eurasian Language Resource Center at Duke University. Okay, so uh, we are going to have kind of two parts, but actually this is not really two different uh, uh, in kind of inform kinds of information that we are going to share with you today, but it's mostly just to have a short mental break in some way in the middle and uh, just brainstorm some ideas, maybe uh, thinking, uh, asking and answering some questions about the first uh, part of our presentation. Uh, uh, we do encourage you to leave your comments and questions in the chat box. Uh, Isa and I, as well as Evgeny, will try to uh, respond to these questions. So, and at the end, we'll uh, hopefully we'll have a little bit more time to share our experiences, to uh, ask more questions or answer some questions or just brainstorm some ideas uh, what to do next after that. Okay, so, and I would like to introduce uh, my colleague and uh, uh, I, I don't know if I can say this as uh, Evgeny referred to Irina, partner in crime, but we definitely have been working with Isa uh, for, for quite a while on various projects. And I wanted to mention something uh, right now when I'm introducing her is that Isa and I are working on the project that is uh, sponsored by uh, Pete uh, Rees and also uh, the University of Indiana uh, Institute, Russian uh, and East European Institute. So this is a, a special um, open educational resource uh, project that uh, Mark Trotter initiated. Uh, uh, we have a team of research assistants and we are trying to develop um, uh, various materials, learning materials that uh, uh, secondary teachers as well as post-secondary instructors can use in their Russian language class to uh, bring more uh, into the classroom, to bring in, into the classroom the topics of diversity and inclusion. So we're currently on this, uh, working on this project and Isa and I, we are, um, uh, we are the uh, facilitators of this project and we are working with the undergraduate team. So uh, stay tuned. Uh, we will keep you posted uh, about the um, uh, about when the the completion of the project, and of course, we'll be happy to share these resources with you. So, is uh, uh, Savinkova is the a scholar uh, is a visiting scholar at the University uh, Dickinson College, right? And uh, she is uh, originally from. Uh, uh, she, her background is originally in uh, Russian as a foreign language, right, or as a second language. So this is her field. And she has been uh, working at Dickinson for the last, I think this is the third year. Right. And why uh, I invited uh, Isa to participate in this project, because she uh, worked with another colleague of mine, Alisa Di Plasio, on some uh, textbook for uh, advanced uh, students of Russian. And the textbook was including uh, materials uh, on inclusion and diversity. Okay, Isa, 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, Olga, thank you for uh, thank you that you introduced me and hello everyone. I'm glad I'm glad to see so many people today and Friday. Um, and I'd like to say thank you to the organizers of the series of the workshops. Um, I still vividly remember our summer sessions and they helped a lot, uh, at least me, to organize my fall classes. I heard many brilliant ideas. And also on Wednesday from Evgeny and Irina, I learned a lot. So uh, I hope today's meeting will help us to find better solutions, how to incorporate ideas um, about diversity and inclusion in our language curriculum and therefore make our classes in the spring and in the future more efficient, meaningful and more engaging for our students. So thank you for joining us today. And before we go on to discuss concrete examples and uh, authentic resources that we use, um, I would like to talk a little bit about the need and importance to include materials about diversity, equity, and inclusion in the Russian language curriculum and their role in increasing um, the motivation of our students. So um, first, uh, I'd like to to tell a little bit about um, our generation of students. So according uh, to Pew Research Center, the students who we teach now belong to the most diverse, the most diverse generation in modern American history. And today's students are attentive to inclusion across race, ethnicity, uh, sexual orientation, gender identity. And they want, they expect schools to live up to those ideas as well. And uh, our language curriculum um, would include at least something from the ideas that they share, they discuss in English with um, their classmates, with their parents, with uh, all other people around. Um, according um, to the results of Generation Z Global Citizenship Survey conducted in 2017, with 20,000 participants, current students openly express their views on gender equality and same-sex marriages. They are aware about different religions. They are not only aware, they are curious, they want to learn more, they respect non-traditional beliefs. This cohort is more ready to discuss topics that seemed um, maybe inappropriate for the previous generations. And about 70% of the people who will um, shape the next decades and who will see in our language classroom very soon from different backgrounds, races, beliefs, which is supposed to be reflected in contemporary language materials. And the choice of materials that I will present today is largely due to the expectations of students and the request from students. But I also acknowledge that we can't um, change completely our teaching materials, replace a textbook we have. So we can incorporate uh, and may, maybe uh, like uh, diversify our teaching materials, incorporating authentic materials. So it's the field where they can help us apart from all other reasons we discussed on Wednesday. Um, and also I'd like to mention one of the brilliant works um, in pedagogy I opened for myself last year, um, The Art of Teaching Russian. And one of the uh, chapters is dedicated to um, issues of diversity and inclusion in Russian language curriculum. And Rachel Stafford fairly points out that there has been a noticeable lack of materials that equitably represent diverse categories of ethnicity, disabilities, and different family relationships. According to the researched and detailed analysis, most of the Russian textbooks commonly used in the US um, schools, high schools and um, undergraduate college programs generally represent Russian, Russian speaking people as Slavs. Uh, also, these people live um, in uh, quite large cities. Also, we don't see people from single parent families. We almost don't see people from low income families. And in addition to that, some of the language uh, learning materials include texts and tasks based on traditional stereotypical relationships between men and women. 
uh, in a family or jokes, um, anecdotes about minoritized groups of population and immigrants. So although the scholar community acknowledges that changes are necessary and new language, second language materials are being developed, I see as one of the ways to hear all voices and represent diversity in the language classroom is to find and incorporate authentic materials to diversify and supplement textbooks we have and text from textbooks. So authentic materials may become the only resource that represents non-dominant groups and communities and cultural narratives such as non-Slavs, uh, non-heterosexual, non-cisgender, non non-male, non-middle, upper class, and others. So, um, so that these voices may be heard in our courses. And also from my experience, I know that if someone's identity um, regularly remains unrepresented in language textbooks and learning materials, it might negatively impact student motivation and create oppressive learning environment um, during class discussions or other activities. And so it significantly, significantly decreases motivation of students. So I don't know, Ola, maybe you can support and tell some, uh, something about your experience. Mm -hmm. So while uh, Isa just uh, talked uh, briefly about the general context of what is happening in the field, in the field of Russian studies and Russian uh, teaching, while I just wanted to present you with some, uh, with, with uh, our personal context as teachers, Isa is teaching at Dickinson College, which is a, a smaller liberal art college. I teach in a large research university, the University of Pittsburgh, with a very diverse uh, student body. So, um, and uh, why, as, as, as educators, why, as instructors of uh, Russian, we became so concerned is that uh, we, um, this necessity came at that time and it kind of uh, came from different, it hit us from different um, uh, angles. So first of all, of course, uh, students, and that's what Irina and Evgeny both uh, talked about on Wednesday, our students want more and more authentic and real life experiences uh, and uh, learning, um, learning activities. So they want to leave their, their uh, classroom and they want to go into real life they want to go into Russian speaking countries, they want to live there, they want to survive there, they want to feel comfortable. And that's what um, this need, it becomes more and more uh, evident nowadays. And that's what uh, makes us uh, change maybe our um, uh, methodology, teaching methodology. We uh, try to incorporate more authentic tasks and texts and also learning experiences and also even authentic goals, what we want them to achieve, right? Do we want them to count from one to 100? Is it like necessary or is it about can we count how much money is left in my pocket, right? So it's kind of like, what is the final goal? What is the final destination of uh, our um, language classes? Of course, uh, we both noticed that the, uh, within past maybe even five, seven, ten years, the uh, the the diverse uh, characteristics of uh, our students uh, ha have increased uh, they became more visible so we have students in our classroom who are more openly express their opinions whether it's a political opinion the social views the philosophical views these are students who uh, more openly share their personal backgrounds or their gender identities and uh, because of this, we we feel like we need to offer them what they what they want, what what they um, what will help them to thrive in in the learning environment, right? And this will be diverse content, and diverse images and texts, and diverse examples, and also relevant learning activities, right? So we also notice that students uh, more and more. Uh, use uh, the environment of uh, uh, educational institutions uh, for their self 
kind of growth of self-identification. So uh, they, they, they're searching for their identity and um, whether it's a secondary or post-secondary environments, um, we kind of need to help, we need to make this, uh, the, this growth, this development, this uh, self-identification uh, processes more comfortable. And uh, for example, what we were discussing, for example, we use different strategies in our language classes, but um, as many of us use, for example, Russian names right, for Russian language classes, especially at uh, novice levels. And um, when I explain my students that you first come to my classroom, you are uh, you're discovering your identity. This is your performative identity. This is your Russian language classroom identity. You can go for whatever you want. You can choose whichever name you want. I refer them to uh, websites with Russian names and uh, tell them that you can choose from any from anything you want. And I had students choosing Fyokla and uh, uh, weird names which we haven't been using for centuries. But it's the, it, was, it was coming from their, their point of view, that's the way how they felt uh, comfortable with these names. And also in, in our Russian language curriculum at Pete, uh, we ha started including um, a small statement in our uh, syllabus about um, uh, personal pronouns and about uh, kind of the uh, controversial nature of Russian language and how it's not uh, always uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, gender welcoming, but we are in our classroom, we are happy to meet their needs and whichever pronoun they want to choose. And if these are elementary students, novice students, I just tell them to remain consistent uh, throughout the ass assignment, right? So because at this point they're still learning gender, they're still learning uh, gender, uh, gender endings for uh, adjectives or even for uh, verbs. So the only thing I, I tell them that I just need to make sure that they use it consistently. So I know that uh, they use grammar properly, but they can use whichever uh, pronoun they want uh, throughout the semester. And that's kind of what I put in my statement. So Isa, I know that you are using something, some different strategy, right, with the names. Well, talking about names, it this summer, for instance, I had a student who uh, wanted to use different gender pronouns in all uh, three languages that students speak. So um, having a female English name, uh, mm, this student wanted to keep uh, he and uh, his on Yivo in Russian language. And so we found a compromise. I just uh, searched for authentic resources like uh, a website uh, and they exist. So Russian parents also, Russian speaking parents also search for these resources, gender neutralny imena, and you can easily find them online. Uh, and there are many names as Sasha, Zhenya, Vanya. Vanya became as a female name. So usually I just print out this list of names and also I give. Um, a list of names such as Alexander, Alexandra, Valentin, Valentina. And so if um, somehow, um, at, uh, I don't know, um, a few uh, courses of Russian later, so they will decide to change their gender pronoun. Uh, they uh, wouldn't need to change their name significantly. They can become Alexander instead of Alexandra. So it's very easy. And uh, there are many resources that provide this information about gender um, neutral, gender neutral imena in Russian language. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, finally, what we've noticed, and I think it became more and more obvious uh, or, over the past few years, and especially in the past year during the pandemic that uh, we have more and more students in the classroom who uh, have um, who openly discuss at least with instructors uh, about the uh, some psychological and me uh, mental challenges they face while they're studying. Uh, we have also students, uh, more students with whom we have to work, uh, who has different um, accommodations, and this is something also we we want to to make sure that it, it uh, we address in our classroom, right? We make sure that this is something. Uh, find to 
to share with us as instructors. We, in, to some extent, we become also their mentors nowadays, and especially during the times of pandemic. And finally, this institutional, I don't know whether it is uh, uh, common in, in your institution, in your schools and your colleges and universities, but I've noticed in several universities where I've been teaching, uh, colleges where I've been teaching, there is this um, institutional push for uh, uh, diversity and inclusion. So there, is, there are a lot of different training uh, programs for faculty and staff. There is a, uh, there is a request from the administration to uh, diversify the curriculum, to make uh, to make some transformations of language classes, uh, to make sure that there are different administrative transfer transformations uh, take place. And of course, when we talk about recruitment, uh, recruiting. Uh, faculty members, recruiting students, graduate students, recruiting undergraduate students into Russian programs. There is also this need of uh, more diverse uh, students, uh, students in, our, in our classroom. And we also noticed something that we still struggling because for example, both uh, Iza and I, we are coming from uh, from the form post-Soviet space, right? So I'm originally from Uzbekistan and Belarus, is this from Russia. So we still have to uh, struggle through fight with our own uh, personal prejudice, something that we stereotypes which we need to get rid of. For example, uh, even trying to be more open to different pronouns, right? To, or trying even to stop using Ruski for everything when you're talking, instead of like, I don't know, maybe Ruskoговорящие, Ruskoязычные, uh, Russian-speaking countries, instead of just Russian countries, Russian, Russian people, right? So something is like, we still have to, 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 to resolve within ourselves, but this is something that also uh, uh, has, um, has impacted uh, on our, uh, on our way, like on our ideas of what we are doing in our classroom. Okay, Isa. Um, yeah, and do you want to-, to Yeah, and of course, yeah, we are not going to talk about this, but just remember that the diversity is very diverse, right? We can talk about numerous, numerous different types of diversity, and we can address different of them in our uh, novice levels to a uh, classroom. We can address some of them um, uh, 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 with uh, greater details in our advanced classes. Of course, uh, you need to choose also which, um, uh, types of diversity is more relevant to your students. You might be teaching in a middle school, elementary school, you might be teaching in a high school, or you might be teach working with, um, uh, for example, uh, uh, senior students, which we do uh, have in our, in our classes uh, at PID. So, and this is something that you need to make sure that you choose what your students need, right? You need to learn about your students. You need to know your students before you can even start this journey. And as I said, some simple ones, and I know people might think that it's maybe very simplistic, right? But it is a, also a very simple step. It's just to uh, to make your to, to diversify your curriculum by including more diverse images, right? To uh, it, we we try to show different kinds of uh, families, different kinds of uh, ethnic diversity. We want to show different kinds of uh, family structures and uh, even just including the images. And uh, Evgeny mentioned uh, on Wednesday, right? Authentic images, instead of stock images, try to find something from, from these countries, right? And that's what we, how we can start, right? We can start at least uh, from uh, this simple, uh, simple, make it a simple step. And also different examples. So uh, as you see, you, these are just slides from my uh, regular classes and this, the arrows and stuff, mostly usually these are interactive slides. So I use annotation uh, like uh, animation. So it pops, pops out. And right now when I had to do a screenshot, you can see everything actually, but usually some information is uh, covered, but students have to talk about different kinds of families, where there are um, two fathers, two mothers, there are multiple parents, there are multiple grandparents, there are uh, families uh, where it's common uh, to live with, uh, uh, there are families in Russia, in the Russian speaking countries where people live with their, um, 
grandparents and their parents. So, and when I use examples, even like as linguistic, linguistic patterns, I try to use authentic ones also to bring this cultural element and even spaces, right? Places and making, the, adding a map or something like this, when you talk about specific place, sometimes it helps. And I uh, use my background and I think this sometimes makes us, uh, make our students feel more comfortable when we share something personal or some kind of our background. So I do tell them that I'm com coming from Central Asia. I was born in Tashkent and then I moved to uh, Belarus. So I'm talking about how I've been exposed to different cultures and how Tashkent was always a multi, um, national multi-ethnic uh, city and this is actually helps me to use my personal experience and my personal example right to talk about uh, diversity in Russian speaking countries and examples as I said like different meals or finding resources where it's uh, from different locations outside Moscow and St. Petersburg <laughs> And, uh, uh, for example, what I also notice uh, very often textbooks, they just give examples of school and universities, and there is a whole uh, layer of uh, Russian speaking society who, uh, which we're missing from this debate, from this discussion, right? It's the people who never went to universities. These are the people who got the Uchilishi, PTU, Technikum, right, uh, special degrees. And we kind of do not introduce students and there are still a lot of people who don't get the university degrees in, in these countries. And that's what I use this on the lab, just integrated small things, just use authentic um, names of different um, uh, educational institutions in Russia and use this opportunity to explain which one is for what and et cetera, okay. Mm -hmm. And also I'd like to add that we, I think we shouldn't be afraid of adding some new words to our quizlets and vocabulary, vocabulary list because sometimes our students need this word as for instance, I hear it very often in my language classes when they ask how to say I'm from a single parent family and we think like, okay, it doesn't belong. And I, I heard it from my colleagues in Russia that, oh, it doesn't belong to the novice level, elementary level, so we shouldn't include it. But I think we, we should start with uh, needs of our students and it's okay if we add a few words to vocabulary or exclude something because we don't need it and um, just expand our vocabulary of our students adding the words they really need. And uh, Olga, thank you for your examples. And I, I think I won't surprise anybody with the usage of uh, infographics, but I think we should mention it. And for instance, in the first semester in my groups of novice students, we can use authentic materials to show different aspects of um, life in Russian speaking countries. And I think infographics is a a uh, really helpful resource because uh, we can use it at all language levels and we can start uh, um, in the first semester just talking about different nationalities and languages and of course we learn how to say они говорят на французском, на немецком, на китайском but also at the end of the chapter we can so we don't need to um, change everything completely but we can add uh, infographics when when they can practice how to say на каком языке говорят и вены and just to practice it and uh, hear these words uh, learn more about um, ethnic diversity of Russian regions and at least uh, find out that there is such a um, region as Yakutia and they learn more and it, it encourages their curiosity um, and especially at the beginning because um, we 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 tend to think that uh, we will do everything later. So at least I, I notice uh, that uh, sometimes I think, okay, maybe it's too different, uh, difficult for them now. So I will bring authentic materials later. But uh, if we um, give them something later, much later, so they probably until the, uh, the moment when they go to Russia, they don't know that in Russia, apart from Russian people live Ukrainci, uh, Vieni, Vienki, Tatari, Bashkiri, and other nationalities. Um, also, um, uh, talking about infographics, um, 
um, for novice students, we can use, um, for instance, you see these infographics about yurts, and we can compare traditional yurt and uh, contemporary yurts, how they look. And actually, we use the same vocabulary lists as uh, we use when we describe apartments and houses from our textbooks. So um, there are some interesting facts about yurts and this uh, infographics. And also uh, you, we can add something because it's very easy to create your own infographic based on the materials they, they have from the text. So first step is just to analyze and talk about the infographic they have. And after the next step, um, maybe for uh, the next year when they um, take Russian as well, they will create their own infographics. So um, there are different types of uh, exercises and tasks we can give them depending on their level. And uh, for novice students, for instance, uh, as a final project for the topic, languages, nationalities, or houses. Uh, so I give them a task to prepare a small presentation about other types of housing using a current chapter's vocabulary. And it's not necessary to prepare everything about Russian regions or uh, ethnic groups that live in Russia. They can uh, prepare something about um, Finnish type of housing. But this rule is uh, uh, we can include free words for naming traditional elements of lifestyle. And so in such way, we just expand their vocabulary and their knowledge about um, different cultures and diff different ethnic groups. Uh, for advanced and intermediate uh, um, levels, infographics is a wonderful way to spark a debate. And uh, here on this slide, you see some resources that I highly recommend where we can find infographics. And um, one of the best one, but I, I wouldn't say that it's not biased. You know, of course, we, we should think what we uh, can bring, but um, it has a really good big thematic classification. So it's easy to find a category um, and choose because there are many infographics about, for instance, uh, women and men in Russian society or um, happiness or religion beliefs. So we can get one category and bring a few infographics to compare different, uh, the results from different years. And it will uh, give students a chance to start a discussion or uh, it works as a warm up. So uh, there are different ways how to incorporate these materials, but they are authentic and they uh, uh, give our students a chance to uh, look at this world, at the situation as Russian speaking people do. Uh, Olya, I know you have also examples within the graphics. Yeah, and what I actually was using, like one of my strategies uh, uh, for using infographics in my classroom and uh, even at the novice level is to campaign for graphics. Right, so you can just choose one infographic and work with it. But for our homework assignment, our novice students in first semester, first year Russian, um, I would give them infographics, let's say they're discussing the fo uh, food, right, the topic was food, and I gave infographics, um, uh, which I found online from Tajikistan, uh, Ukraine, and uh, Kazakhstan. And as you can see, this is very simple, simple words, simple information. And the task was uh, for them to, of course, answer the questions, right? They, they're doing reading comprehension. They're trying to, to find a hunt for, infor for the information in the text. But also I'm asking them to compare, right? And I know that comparison, uh, according to the actual um, guidelines, would, be, would belong to the domain of advanced level students. But this is a very simplistic uh, comparison, and it makes it more interesting because they compare what people in Ukraine eat and what pe with people uh, in Kazakhstan and they find some similarities or they find some differences and you can uh, you can add or you can re refer them to some additional resources about for example uh, the background culture background uh, kachevniki and how this affected this um, uh, the people's uh, meal preferences and what is I noticed what is interesting with infographics at the end I would ask my students to 
had uh, this like personal touch when they compare this informa information that they found in these infographics to their own experiences or to what they know about their own culture, right? We are trying to make them global citizens, uh, form them into global citizens. And of course, comparing other cultures to their own is, is an important move. And as you can see, I use the, the program Edgy, which allows me to post this uh, text and then they respond, they, these dots here, they put the dots at the specific infographic and they respond to, the, to this in writing, it's here on the left in writing, but it also gives you an opportunity to kind of to uh, create a semi-authentic um, semi uh, experience when they are comparing, or for example, they're asking more questions, follow-up questions. Let's say if they met a person from Kazakhstan, they would say, uh, what about, uh, we love uh, hot doggy and pizza, right? They can ask questions, thus practicing uh, kind of intermediate level uh, skills, uh, forming questions, asking questions, but something that is uh, more likely uh, be needed if they go to these countries, if they encounter these people and they will be asking about their um, food preferences. So, and the next one, which uh, again, uh, Isa mentioned that some infographics, even on this uh, Russian websites, uh, like you need to be very careful what you select, how you select. And of course you want to make sure that if you do find infographics uh, that, uh, that are developed based on stereotypes, you, you need to be ready to talk about this. You need to be, uh, you need to prepare your students in the classroom. So what I do, this is this my teaching strategy which I use. So for example, I presented them the several, several resources about uh, hobbies in the United States, how Russians uh, presented what Americans like to do uh, during their spare time. And then my students interacted with this information. They interacted with infographics and some articles, short articles, and then they they, uh, let's say they disagreed and they said, oh no, <laughs> this, this is not what uh, young Americans do, at least not from their perspective, from the perspective of uh, students uh, from uh, a large research university in Pennsylvania. And I would ask them, okay, now you create your own infographics. And this is a sample of after they analyzed all these uh, other authentic materials, they created their own infographics, thus correcting, <laughs> of course, from their perspective, correcting this information by creating this, uh, their infographics about uh, American hobbies uh, or the hobbies of young Americans. Okay. Um, and also, apart from infographics, I, I like using interactive maps and uh, mm, there are now I, I don't know since I started using it um, there has there have appear, appeared many of interactive uh, maps and one of the projects called Gastronomiczka Karta Rosia the project was launched um, in 2018 and it's still developing on the website there is a Russian map with information about the most famous national uh, traditional dishes from local restaurants and uh, working with the resource, students learn uh, more about um, different cuisines, see how dishes look, read names of ingredients, and they will understand uh, the specificity of a particular region. And one of the favorite tasks of uh, my students is to pick up, uh, to pick a place uh, for breakfast. They have to invite their friends for breakfast, considering their dietary preferences and try to surprise them with national cuisine. Also, they can easily count how much it costs to have breakfast in Murmansk area and in Murtia. Uh, they can participate in a role play in which one of them is a foreign tourist and another one is a restaurant owner who can tell about the features of national cuisine and recommend some dishes. And also, um, it surprises me how they work because they trying to search information about this region, about uh, people who live there and bring it in their commercial for the restaurant as a, um, like, for instance, telling why these people like fish or uh, why they cook something. So they explain and um, so for such simple tasks as we usually do with students 
working with textbooks, we uh, encourage students to learn more about uh, different areas and different regions. And also um, it, gives, it gives them a chance to learn more about um, the culture through um, uh, its cuisine. So it's, um, I think it's one of the benefits of usage of this site. And also, um, sorry. Um, the second example is um, Atlas Religi and Nationalnosti Rasii. It's also an, an interactive uh, map. Research service Srida conducted a massive uh, survey in 2012, and they asked people from different regions of uh, Russia about their religion beliefs, uh, family values, level of happiness. Uh, um, so the different information collected in and created maps uh, combining the survey results with the census data of 2010, and their website offers uh, it has an English version as well. So the site allows us to check, for example, in which regions of the country the most Muslim live, Muslims live um, in section Interesni um, You see it uh, now on the screen. So uh, students can find information about, for instance, a man role in a family in different regions. It's beneficial resource for language classes because First, students learn more about the Russian uh, regions, the local people, they get a chance to compare the regions and portray people from different regions uh, to see the difference in views between citizens of different regions. And also the most um, interesting thing is that they can compare views on different uh, things and also um, uh, diversity of population in Moscow, St. Petersburg and all other regions. So uh, also they like making up questions for the survey section, adding something and add some questions to this section. And um, also yeah, you see it now on the screen, uh, the red test and the interactive online games on the website that give more exciting information about religions, nationalities and Russian mentality, uh, also mentality of uh, people who speak Russian but uh, don't belong to Russians ethnically. So even, even if students don't give the right answers and um, it's most likely that they don't give right answers, we learn, they learn some new facts and um, to combine it in a text and present it to another group. Uh, so um, definitely they like guessing um, because it, it also encourages their curiosity. Uh, well, uh, I think. Yes. And I, I believe also that interactive, the use of interactive maps nowadays during the time of pandemics is, is especially uh, evident because uh, students are sitting and kind of learning a little bit passively behind the Zoom, uh, you know, uh, in front of the computers, uh, behind, hiding behind Zoom. And uh, by being able to click on something, right, to make this extra move, I think this also motivates and uh, encourages them to be more uh, active and more proactive in their language classes. So, for example, there is a separate uh, map uh, that the post nauka has created uh, on uh, yiziki rasi right the uh, languages of russia and uh, i just wanted to warn you that it's still uh, it's still uh, um, under development so there are several areas where you can press right so you can see just screenshots here uh, and uh, students can press on these uh, regions and then they will see the information what uh, a group of languages uh, e is used in this region and it's very simple actually the very first slides when they click very simple just the name of the language group so it's appropriate for novice levels and then uh, when you click on it and open this specific group, there are uh, numerous articles, resources here, for example, here in Uralski Zeki. And when you press on it in your upper right corner, you'll see there is a small information, like a small text available. So of course the text might be more appropriate for uh, intermediate and advanced level students rather than novice, but some information can still be used at the very, very uh, novice levels. Next, uh, also the map of, um, uh, of languages, 
So this is also a very simple uh, map, which uh, is uh, developed by current time. And I think it can be used in novice levels, uh, in the novice level classroom, because it gives very simple information. So it gives the categories of uh, state uh, language and the officially used language in the region or like uh, Russian region or former republics, right, post -Soviet, in the post-Soviet space. And as you can see, when you click, the text is very, uh, very small, very short, which is um, uh, possibly can be used uh, in uh, even in the first year Russian, uh, first semester of Russian. Okay, so, and, uh, and as you can see, different ones. So this is another one, Karta is the Kofrasiska Federacji. If you want to introduce your students to the uh, to the diversity of languages in uh, in Russian Federation, and to tell them that not only Russian language is the, <laughs> the Ru Russian language is not the only language that the people speak there. Of course, you can uh, send them to uh, to Wikipedia or some kind of encyclopedia page, but it, it's not going to be as interactive as interesting because they can click and discover. They can. Um, uh, they can go even on scavenger hunt. For example, you can you can tell them uh, find the region in which they uh, speak this language or that language, and then they it can it can be in some kind of competition in the classroom where students who complete their task uh, uh, first they will get like extra po uh, po uh, bonus points or something like this. And again, um, many of these maps are very very uh, simple in terms of the text is not uh, too dense, and it is of course the, the vocabulary is more advanced level but there are also a lot of um, cognates there and you can also prepare maybe a, a tiny tiny list of vocabulary for them to work with these maps but as i said this is a really good uh, alternative for just a list of languages or let's say a wikipedia page mm -hmm. And this resource, I think it's also very exciting because it, it was uh, created by uh, Belarusians. And um, this is a map of national costumes in, uh, in Belarus. And what, why I like this resource, because it includes also uh, audio commentary. So on the left, audio guide, if you press, it's very short, about between one minute and two minutes long. Um, the vocabulary, of course, a little bit more advanced, but it can be used probably in intermediate Russian. Uh, but even at the very, very novice level, uh, students can use this, um, uh, this map to click on different, uh, in di different parts of uh, Belarus, right? And explore that even within a, such a tiny country right, as Belarus, there, are, there is such a diversity of uh, cultural, uh, national, kind of uh, specificities and uh, even costumes in different regions is different. And the novice students can just go to the first one, right? Just the name of the region and maybe uh, like a basic information. But if it's an advanced students, you can tell them to explore more and get into the uh, details. There are the Chitai Dalsh, if you can see, read more, there is more information written there for appropriate for advanced level students. Mm -hmm. And now something which I personally love, love and kind of was discovering during the pandemic. So authentic experiences, right? They are not really authentic, they're semi-authentic experiences, but they're close enough uh, for our students to explore the space, to explore the urban space, to explore the provincial space uh, of our uh, countries um, uh, uh, under the question. And uh, this uh, program, Windows uh, Swap, uh, I discovered during the pandemic and uh, our students used uh, it to, uh, in order to explore the space and to see what it is to live, let's say in, um, in Kazakhstan or to live in Kyiv or in Kazan. And the students, uh, these are just users, right? These are, are real, real people who live in these, um, in these uh, cities, in these countries. They go to this website and they record a view, live view from their, from their window. And uh, you can see, right, it's not, these are not stills, it's actually video. And you can even uh, create an activity where students can, can guess, for example, do you think this, uh, and again, talking about like social economic diversity, right? 
what do you think? Where is this person lives? Is it an urban space? Is it a big city? Is it a small city? What do you think? This is. Do you think that can you can you think about like is this person is like well to do or is it a medium income family? Because sometimes you have uh, objects uh, on the screen right on the window. So there is can, you can explore this as I said semi authentic uh, uh, experience of Russian speaking countries without actually going there. And the next uh, website, which I also uh, like, it's it's also new. It also offers, uh, unfortunately, offers only a few cities in uh, in Russia right now. It's uh, Saint Petersburg, Moscow. I think there is Kiev and there is Kazan. But this is City Walk Live, and students this, again. Someone is just recording uh, real people who live in the cities. They record uh, a walk. A walk through the city and the best part is that it also comes with uh, audio so you can press here and there will be even the sound of the street so it is the closest they can experience without going on a study abroad tour and you can explore the city uh, if you want to introduce the diversity and talk about uh, how people with um, uh, physical uh, limited abilities can can survive in the city right so for example they can walk and they can see Oh, uh, e, uh, is there access to the stores? Uh, are there uh, are the roads good enough for people in uh, wheelchairs? You can explore different things, or you can even look and see who are uh, around. What are the people? Whom do you see? And um, of course, you can uh, use it for the for advanced level students to get into more detail, more description. But even for novice students, uh, you can talk about what kind of buildings are they. Who, who who is on the street, what they wear, uh, what do you think they, they uh, like, is it an urban space? Is it like a residential area? Is it a business area? Even discuss things like this. Okay, Isa. Mm -hmm. And finally, there are numerous, numerous opportunities online, and I'm not going even to give you all of them because a lot of museums open their virtual uh, tours uh, right now and over the past several years. And I think uh, with the pandemic, the boom of all this virtual 3D uh, excursions and tours is just uh, there. And uh, But one resource is through culture, right? The um, uh, .ru website sponsored by the Russian Federation, by the state uh, uh, institution organizations, virtuální pragulky, right? And it has a list of different places you can uh, visit both outside and inside, like historical places, krajevěčské muzeje, right? And also with the culture museum, this is the link at the bottom, you can see a map and you can even geographically try to locate different museums and different uh, places that you can visit and learn about these regions by visiting their um, architect architectural uh, sites or cultural sites, uh, uh, ethnographical museums, and etc. Yeah, or I'm also a fan of different virtual tours. And uh, while I was in self isolation, I watched a lot of different virtual excursions. But uh, the the most I think the biggest problem I faced is that most of my students won't be able to understand anything, only visually to go somewhere and just to see walk around. So um, that's why I, I started uh, searching for more materials. And surprisingly, I I found, uh, I, I would say, I, I started exploring a new world, uh, websites and projects of national libraries and uh, uh, local museums, Krajewiecki Muzei. So I don't know uh, how I could miss that moment when they developed their websites and um, they, they look really good, some of the websites. And uh, on this uh, slide, you see, um, uh, uh, website, one of the pages of website of um, local museum on Kamchatka, Karine Malachislene Narodi. And so we work on um, this uh, with this site with my advanced students, and I gave them this link uh, when they worked on projects about similarities and differences between small nations' uh, style, lifestyles and um, endangered ethnic groups. 
So they have to read information about the ethnic groups on Kamchatka and compare their traditions, daily life elements and current situation with the languages and education uh, with uh, in the US. So um, yeah, um, and there are many other um, ethnic groups that um, you can find on uh, this website and some other websites of national libraries. Um, or the, the most beneficial thing for me at least because uh, is that um, these websites are developed for kids, for children. So um, most of the text that are there can be understood by our advanced students. And um, surprisingly, for instance, Kamchatka's ethnic groups have um, a lot of um, in common with the United States indigenous people. And it's also essential to, for me, to search for materials that represent diversity globally. So um, yes, of course, we discuss a lot about Russian regions, Russian speaking countries, ethnic diversity in those regions, but also I'd like my students to look for mutual features to find a common solution to resolve some global problems. And these uh, websites of national libraries, uh, libraries give um, us such opportunities because they uh, not only publish this information, but also they, um, some of them, for instance, this one, Kamchatka's National um, Museum, they um, make uh, short videos about current situation and um, people who belong to these ethnic groups to show their current situation and just to draw attention, our attention to their problems. So um, um, I found this project interesting and um, got a quite um, very well feedback from my students. So um, I think um, it's a good uh, way to develop these competences um, in a such way. And now we're going to have a couple minute break. I know that there are some questions. For example, Susan, if you want, just unmute yourself and ask your question. I don't know, Susan raised her, her hand, but I'm not sure. Susan? Okay, I know that we had uh, some chat going on busy there. Uh, uh, can I ask you a question? Oh, yes, yes, okay, Nat Natasha, uh, of course. Yeah, Natasha. Um, so, um, thank you so much for the presentation. It, it was awesome. So, and uh, going back to the beginning of your presentation, remember when you were talking about pronouns mm -hmm. and you said that you put that information in the syllabus and you allow them to choose their own pronouns. So if somebody of your students wants to address them as they, how do you particularly uh, work with verb conjugations? What, what then during the class, they just say, yeah, учимся в университете, я ходили в школу вчера. This is what I'm interested in because it's not really authentic. So, and I'm kind of, you know, still confused because in Russia it's not uh, spread yet. So that was my yeah. question. Thank you. you. See the, the, even you said that it's not authentic because this is all social constructs. And what we are doing, we are trying to change them. And there are a lot of LGBTQ uh, um, uh, communities and organizations in Russia who are developing, who are working, uh, uh, organizations that are working on this, uh, on this question, what pronouns to use. And we, I've, I've done some research and there are different, uh, different options. Yes, the people use ANI. Uh, there is an option when some uh, LGBTQ uh, acti uh, activists use even uh, a no, but again, there is there is a big uh, no from some uh, members of the community because it's neutral gender and it's kind of, we use it only to neodushevlionne, right, inanimate objects. Uh, there is a solution, a potential solution to use, to go back to old roots and use anye. Right, and uh, so there, are, there is still that's that's the problem that we are still in the beginning of this part. Yeah, but but, the... but still, if for instance my student says yeah, but but at the same time wants to conjugate all the verbs as I need, 
you know, ya hodim, for instance. So in this case, your suggestion would be then use like, for instance, me instead of ya. So we could address her as ani. Okay, so if you're talking about the verb, the verb specifically, the first person uh, uh, singular and uh, the uh, in the present tense and the future tense wouldn't be such an issue, but the yeah. issue would be the past tense, right? That's what it is. Like, how would you use ya hadila, hadilo, hadili? So, right. And as I said, there is it's it's still it's still developing, and we are not we are in the beginning. Uh, I didn't have students who would choose I need for now. For example, what I had, I had kind of gender fluid students, uh, non binary students who would say, uh, "Today I, I'm uh, Anna." Mm -hmm. Today I'm Anna, and they do everything from the point of Anna, referring ya pashla, ya zdielala, uh, and then tomorrow they show up, and next time they show, say uh, ya pashol, okay. ya zdielal, and as long as they're consistent. So here's the problem with novice students: it's only when I tell them about consistency. As long as you stick to one for the purpose, let's say, of the lesson, right, or for the uh, for the uh, for this specific homework assignment. I'm fine because mm -hmm. I still need to know how comfortable you are with uh, changing uh, endings for uh, nouns, for adjectives, for verbs in the specific, if it's specific gender, right? If it's specific number, it's it's never an issue with advanced level students who are already comfortable with this, right? It's without, uh, with, um, with the novice students. And as I said, so far I had, I haven't, I, I haven't had an experience with students you choosing any, right? So it's, I guess that's not something we'll have to explore. And again, it's only when it comes uh, to, uh, to the station when they're talking about themselves, right? But very often if they're talking about someone else and you know that they say, they're referring to themselves as ya pashla, ya vanya, uh, so everyone else would be referring to this student as ah, Vanya Harosha Studentka, the way how students uh, refer to, to themselves. Yeah, and Olya, if you let me, I will add a little bit. So I, I, yeah, I don't include this information in my syllabus, but uh, from first lessons, I am quite open with my students and tell them that actually they eat it can be it can be impossible to express uh, their identity uh, like uh, as in a way they want to express it in Russia in some communities. So for instance, I, I tell them honestly that beyond LGBTQ community, you won't be able to pronoun they, them. You will be able to, uh, choose, but you will have uh, a choice. Um, you will have a choice, use on Iliana. And so in such case, you just have to choose it for communication with people who maybe you don't trust or you know that they can interpret your um, your choice in the wrong way. So um, I think we uh, it's a bad, it's a good idea. It would be um, to organize uh, maybe an additional uh, webinar and invite people who belong to LGBTQ community in Russia or Russian speaking countries to hear their voices, how they prefer uh, express their ideas. Because uh, I've heard the same. I I'd like to. Um, uh, and I agree with Olga that uh, some of my friends in Moscow and in Moscow, we know that LGBTQ community is quite developed. Yeah, so they don't use any uh, when they speak with people who don't belong to this community. Yeah, but they use any in general when they, for instance, there is a, I think a fabulous uh, online journal at Kritiya. I highly recommend it to people who are in the field and um, I give some articles to my students at advanced level from this uh, online journal and they use in some articles I need and uh, past forms uh, like me prishli, uh, ya prishli uh, and different forms you can find in this article. So it depends on the offer. And also I'd like to, to hear all like as many voices as I can to get more information about it. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, and at this point, I will just probably just suggest to move on because I know this is the topic of a separate workshop. I've been trying to organize a workshop like this or a roundtable uh, on this topic for quite a while. So we can definitely think about this as our next, <laughs> next event. But uh, I wanted to move on and just show a little bit other examples and other resources that you can use, authentic resources that you can use in your language classroom uh, in order to explore these topics of uh, diversity and exclusion. Uh, inclusion, sorry. Isa? Um, so, so, in just next slide. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so um, I think surveys, yeah? Or Mm -hmm. Yeah, so when we talked about diverse uh, examples, we are also talking about diverse opinions and di uh, diverse uh, points of view, diverse, uh, uh, diverse subjects. And uh, I've noticed that surveys, uh, both uh, type printed and uh, video surveys are very useful resources in, in the both levels, like novice, intermediate levels and advanced level classrooms. So, and um, uh, we use a lot in our language class, classes. So for example, talking about uh, profession and what is interesting because um, I, choose, I choose samples of the service where we might uh, even ask students like guess who they are, right? Who is who? Student, engineer, mechanic, starship, journalist, pedagog, pomochnik. And it's interesting that this allows our students, it's like this pretext, um, pre-activity, uh, pretext activity, uh, they are trying to guess. And then after we watch, we discover that even they have some kind of stereotypes and prejudice, uh, like who, who, who can potentially uh, have what kind of profession. So I think surveys are useful in this regard. And the next one is, the, um, uh, for example, you can introduce different uh, family structures. For example, this whole uh, word of uh, um, definition, многодетная мама, who is многодетная мама, and what are they doing? So this is uh, the whole debate about многодетные матери, uh, which is we don't talk a lot about uh, about like uh, about this in in American culture, right? people with three children and more, these are многодетные семьи. But this is something that we definitely need to draw attention to. And uh, I'm using it actually not as a central point of my activity, right? This is about the topic is uh, from Puti, internet and com uh, internet a computer. Where they're discussing something computer, the usage of uh, internet and computer. But then I also refer to something as like, um, uh, on a side note, I, I talk about this as a, as a cultural uh, topic as a, a cultural point. And for example, I use also surveys. I try to search uh, for surveys which uh, come not from uh, Rush, uh, Russia, but from, uh, let's say, former republics. And that allows us also to introduce that in Kyrgyzstan, for example, people also speak Russian and they're uh, different kind of uh, uh, ethnically, uh, ethnic people in Kyrgyzstan and they have different kind of hobbies. And especially like, this survey was useful because um, uh, I was able also to introduce a, a cultural component for for example, one of the uh, people uh, on the in this survey mentioned about um, their interest in music and that they play a, a kamuz, right, a, a national Kyrgyz uh, musical instrument. So that was uh, my way to introduce even a small a small uh, detail without uh, si being sidetracked. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And also one of the ways to bring up a new topic to the language classroom and start a discussion about diversity and inclusivity is using ads and commercials. So um, such type of ad and commercial is called социальная реклама in Russia. So if you use Yandex or YouTube, you can uh, search for different um, ads and commercial about um, categories um, of ecology, um, people with special needs, people with disabilities, children and so I um, bring it um, sometimes such images uh, to start a topic and not only the topic so yes of course with advanced students I have a separate uh, um, 
um, topic that is um, dedicated to people with special needs and disabilities, disabled people, but also uh, such projects and commercials can be used in um, all other topics just to warm up and bring social issues to discuss. So social reklama and um, different categories of you can choose and um, we, we, we read signs on posters, analyze word combinations and explain how they understand the ideas. After that, we discuss the role and importance of uh, similar ads and commercials. Um, and such ads you can easily find, as I said, and, but it surprises students with, that in Russian speaking um, countries, we have special posters on streets that draws our attention to social um, issues. So they even bring it later to show me what they found. And another kind of um, social initiatives that can be relevant and applicable for our students is social projects on crown, crowdfunding uh, platforms such as Planeta. Um, it's not necessary to give uh, all the projects about uh, people with uh, special needs, but also if we talk about uh, technology, computer, and new programs, Usually I find projects from different fields, like one uh, ecology projects, another project for um, children with special needs. Um, maybe this project is about um, special uh, apps for deaf people, uh, how to watch uh, cinema or um, for blind people. And they, can, they should evaluate um, and choose the projects that can be uh, important, essential for society and also uh, why people should invest their money and help this project. So uh, usually I find um, like, and, and students get a task to prepare a speech to promote the project or based on the given projects, as you see here, they have to do their own social project with goals and uh, tasks and explain. So they watch these presentations. Uh, usually these video, uh, uh, very short and uh, um, easy because people try to speak slowly. They want to promote their project. They uh, explain goals and uh, it's a perfect resource uh, to teach our students to give presentations. Uh, and uh, of course, protest signs. So um, um, not only those you see here, but from different regions. Uh, and it's also a perfect resource to start spark a debate or start a discussion, bring a topic to the classroom, or um, maybe to start with protest signs and move on to discuss news um, that are relevant at that moment. William? So, and of course, we have uh, various, various resources that we encounter every day or weekly, and Russians uh, have uh, always encountered them. And so we've been using this in our novice levels to uh, classrooms, uh, for example, business cards. And what it was uh, useful that uh, we did not just introduce this is actually week two. They just had two classes and already their activity was to, uh, to uh, interact with these uh, business cards, right, a visit key. And uh, I would collect them from different, uh, different uh, parts of uh, Russia, from Belarus, Ukraine, Kazakhstan. And um, this will allow me to introduce different regions, right, geographical region, but also different names. Right, how different names and uh, the formation. I can not. I am not. Uh, I don't spend a lot of time on this, but I, you, you can spend a little bit of time just telling them how, for example, names in um, Uzbekistan or Kazakhstan they they are formed, and how you can potentially uh, find the the stem or like identify the stem where it belongs to, to which region, to which country it belongs. Right, or the most common names in these regions. So, and students again, they uh, had to do this both in written word, in a written form, but also recorded some audio commentary. Also, um, our students worked with uh, ads. Right, again, ads is a really useful, uh, useful resource. You can find them uh, online, uh, different online, uh, like Izruk Vruki. Uh, we used uh, specifically during the topic of housing. We used about um, uh, 
rent to rent out, right? Renting something. And uh, we would have posters, which I found online. And this is the opportunity for us to, uh, to introduce this kind of sensitive topic about how still there are debates about how many people, uh, renters, right? How many renters are limiting the opportunities uh, to rent their um, housing uh, for people uh, of non-Slavic, uh, non-Slavic heritage. So this is, this doesn't have to be a central kind of uh, topic of our uh, of our of our lesson, right? The lesson is to teach them how to find the apartment for rent, utilities, and uh, stuff like this. But this is something that we can uh, draw attention and even ask them to to comment and say, "What do you think?" Oh, because even visually, sometimes they are like very distinctly seen, like capital letters or something like this. Mm -hmm. Also signs, and this is good. Uh, this is a very good uh, resource for very, very novice students from the very beginning. You can find different places and restaurants and stores with uh, geographical locations, with name of uh, republics and uh, cities. So you can start introducing this through buildings, like uh, signs, and then uh, ask students, for example, to post this on the interactive map, use some kind of interactive whiteboards and ask them, okay, find where this uh, restaurant, if it's called Tajikistan, where would you place it on the map? If it's restaurant uh, Uzbekistan, where would you place it on the map? Where is this republic? Right? Where is this country? But also introducing that in some of these uh, countries, uh, uh, Russian language uh, exists, uh, coexists with uh, their, their language, right? And the uh, Vivisky, all these signs where they have kind of uh, both Russian and Kyrgyz, Russian and Uzbek. And this is a good way of just introducing students because if they go to these republics, because there are a lot of study abroad programs nowadays in Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan, so there is uh, more likely they will encounter this experience, right? And we need to prepare them for this. Mm -hmm. And uh, class schedule, for example, I ask, this is a part of the project that uh, our teach, uh, our research team is working, finding a schedule from different uh, uh, post-Soviet countries and to find out what they study, what languages they study, what subject they study. And many of them, you see, they study, like, for example, Kazakh language and Russian, and they study uh, Russian, even maybe more than they study Uzbek or something like this. So, and this is an opportunity just to start a discussion about the status of languages, status of Russian language in different countries, in different countries, the status of national languages, right? So, and it's from simple. And menu, this is just something I just wanted to draw attention, probably many of you using this, but just go and find these resources that are inter more interactive menus online, uh, like uh, Isa showed you this uh, Gaster map, but this is something that also can help you to introduce the region uh, and regional uh, cultures and um, ethnic, uh, ethnic uh, cultures and traditions. Mm -hmm. And store, I know there was uh, some comment about stores, but uh, stores is, is really great. Uh, shopping online is a very great way to introduce authentic experience, right? Especially now with the stock, with the uh, delivery during the pandemic. But I use this opportunity also to kind of help students to uh, navigate through like social socioeconomic diversity. So um, our students worked with this website, um, and they uh, frog, uh, dot ru where they had to purchase um, a meal. But what we did, we did, as you can see on the left, it's on Miro. Uh, I created several groups and each group had different uh, amount of money. And before that, you would give them like an infographic, for example, or even basic information, some short articles about what is the income of uh, teachers or how much money teachers make or uh, what is the uh, average uh, pension in Russian speaking countries, right? Or what is this uh, average student stipend in these countries? And then you give them this, and this was a limitation. For example, this group would take, have 1,000 to survive for a week and they had to go and purchase. And this group would have 
uh, 20,000 rubles, right? And it's kind of just to, to add this element and say like, look, now you're shopping and what you need, because they have to go and look through all this um, grocery list, right? And see, make sure that they, um, they have enough money and that at the end they had to report, this is Nova students, they had also to report how much they have left. Right. So they had to tell us this is actually talking about numbers. Our students were practicing numbers and also practicing uh, adding ruble, two rubles, three rubles, uh, 20 rubles. Right. So all these grammatical also concepts, but in the specific context. And that also helped to kind of um, talk about uh, uh, different socioeconomic uh, in, uh, uh, backgrounds of uh, people in these countries. Mm -hmm. And then there are numerous, numerous projects nowadays on the internet. That's something like you can explore. You can explore and some of this you would find uh, irrelevant or inappropriate for your context or for your students, but some of them can be useful. So for example, this one, that's an analyst, Toki Krasati, they use, it's like a, uh, just uh, random uh, people, right? These are not professional models. They just needed to record a video about themselves, about their um, national uh, cultural background. And then they uh, created this whole website. And that's how they introduced different regions like Altaika, Ka, uh, uh, tam? Zashka, Uzbechka, and all these different ones. So this is just an opportunity to introduce something authentic. And they have small video on YouTube on YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. And also there is a, an internet project, Sarasi, Narodirasi. So this is short videos where they introduce um, uh, uh, dolls, dolls from different regions, Russian regions, and also, uh, and they all dress differently. If you go further, you can find more information, but even for novice level students, this is just a tiny, tiny, like few seconds video of you're looking at these dolls in different uh, ethnic costumes, and uh, you also have the names of different uh, ethnic groups uh, uh, in Russian Federation. Mm -hmm. And there is there are also like Victorina, like uh, quizzes. Of course, they develop for kids, for children, um, uh, Russian-speaking children. But you, as as the same, similar to the example that uh, Isa showed you, that you can give your students an opportunity to. Uh, use this uh, to play this quiz and they're more likely they will fail because I fail. <laughs> I didn't know the answers. But this is another way to present material, to present new information for them about um, different regions and their languages and cultures and their uh, bit, right? Their everyday life. Mm -hmm. And also there are projects for uh, by different organizations for students, uh, for people with limited abilities. So there are apps and websites where people can go and they can mark if there is a, uh, like, uh, in, uh, there is no access to, uh, for people with wheelchairs in the city. So you can just use this app when you're introducing the topic of the city and just maybe explore how, how accessible the specific part of this uh, Russian or Russian speak uh, or former uh, post Soviet city is. Mm -hmm. And contests, I found actually very interesting because there are different different contests for children, uh, for children and not only children, for uh, children with special needs, for people with uh, limited abilities. And they, um, they're also a good resource just to talk about well, that Russians are not only those Russians who we see in our textbooks, right? The image of, <laughs> um, I don't know, this height, this way, this appearance people, but they're different people, different, and they, are, they do exist in Russia. And of course you can uh, bring more context for advanced uh, level um, when they are able to discuss and how there is still a lot of things that are not, um, uh, they're not developed for people from this uh, group, right? Uh, there are still a, a lot of things that need to be resolved in, in, in these countries, but the fact that they are visible and you find them and you can research and look through their work, what they're creating, right? Uh, this is a great way, I think, to introduce this topic as well. Mm -hmm. And finally, it's like children's resource. Who doesn't like children's resources? I just wanted to 
we just wanted to leave it here. Most of you probably familiar already, Garasa Matsvetov and Multi Russia. Multi Russia has very small uh, um, uh, multifilm animations about different regions uh, of Russian Federation. The language is somewhat complex. You might have to do some scaffolding, but it's just another resource you want to, to consider. And for example, there is an uh, animation, uh, Domiki. And it introduces different national and cultural housing. Like uh, Isa was talking about Yurta. Here, there is a whole uh, uh, episode about Yurta, right? So, and you can also use it for uh, in, in your secondary and post-secondary setting. Mm -hmm. And also there are school materials, I Isa, you think you, you got the wrong slide. It was there. So I just wanted to mention that uh, there are a lot of on YouTube, there are a lot of materials, uh, videos, and Akruzhaisha um, Srida uh, for subjects, right? High, uh, school subjects, elementary, middle school subjects. And uh, the language is more or less simple. So it can be used at the novice intermediate level with some scaffolding, but it's also introduced the, the diversity of Russia and languages and uh, uh, and uh, uh, and one, I think the channel on YouTube, which I was posting here, for some reason didn't come through. It's Info Rock. Info Rock. It's called Info Rock. And of course, we'll have all these uh, resources uh, put together as a list with links. So, and we can send these uh, resources to you with the recording of this presentation. So, I think at this point we kind of got sidetracked. And but if you do have any questions, suggestions? This is, we have a couple minutes. Okay, let's see in the chat. I know that people were, uh, how about we'll find, I will save this chat and we'll see if there are any useful resources, especially about this uh, pronouns and gender uh, discussion in the classroom. We can just, we can just add as links uh, to our email with the recording. Um, I know that what do they do in Russia with the pronouns? As I said, it's still an ongoing discussion, it's still ongoing development, but I can share with you a couple articles because I've been compiling some articles uh, about this. So I can, I can uh, include these uh, resources in the, in the email with the recording after that. Okay. Any any other questions? Uh huh. Yeah, I know that there are some suggestions about there is a good resource to learn more about racism in Russia and Russian speaking countries and what is being done in Russia to fight racism and discrimination based on national origin. And of course, these topics are uh, much easier to introduce at the advanced level, student uh, like uh, and uh, even have debates and discussions, but. Uh, I guess for me, one of the challenges is like, how do you do, what do you do in your novice uh, level classroom, right? They have limited uh, uh, ling uh, language abilities. There is not much they can express. They can get frustrated if there is something they want to share with you. And of course, there is an opportunity maybe to share it uh, after, after, uh, after your class is over. Maybe you can create a specific space in your learning management system where students can leave some notes notes, uh, some ideas, and you can even like say, uh, you know, as long as it's related to something uh, like uh, Russian speaking, Russian culture uh, 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 topics, feel free to even use English and comment here in your learning management system. So maybe something just to start discussions, even if at the level of novice, it's, it's still in their, uh, in their own language, not in the target language. Okay, so we have some resources. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, Silangs have been doing this, have been, and yes, there, there, there is, a, a, I think there, there, there are debates about this, there are discussions, the, the ongoing discussion is happening, right? But uh, 
Okay. Okay, I think we don't have any questions anymore. I think it's, but I think that this is a good, um, what is happening in the chat, I think it's a good uh, uh, sign to the CTR that maybe we are ready for another round table, for another uh, series of workshop discussions uh, where we can all share the uh, resources, right? We uh, started uh, covering the topics of LGBTQ and race and uh, yeah, let's continue our discussions. And as, I, as we said, like, as we proposed in this workshop, this uh, way, our goal was today is just to introduce you to resources and strategies, teaching strategies on how to open this discussion in your own classroom. Um, if I can just say thank you so much, um, Olga and Isa, to both of you for sharing these resources and really inspiring um, I feel absolutely inspired um, to do um, to do more um, uh, in in the classroom, and I agree that we can do this in the target language, but also in English in a native language or you know the dominant language of the students that we teach. And um, this uh, webinar ties so nicely with the discussion with. Um, was it the second national ACTR conversation uh, dedicated to these issues? And, and it's, it's great that we have this webinar with maybe more practical specific ideas for uh, the language classroom, including on the lower level of instruction. And, and I absolutely agree that we need to explore this, this topic more and we will work on that. So colleagues, we promise that there will be more exploration. Thank you so much again. Thank you, everyone, for spending your Friday afternoon, Friday evening with us. So good luck with your classes next week, right? Whether you or next next month, depending on when you start. So yes, and let's stay in touch and feel free to email Isa and me if you have any ideas, any suggestions. And as I said. We are happy to share all the resources as a list of um, links, which we found and uh, you're welcome to explore them. You are, are welcome to contact us and say, how, how are you using this specifically? Can you give me an idea how you're using this in your language classroom? And we will be happy to, to share this with, with you as well. Yeah, and, and if I could just ch uh, chime in here. Um, I, uh, it, it's so wonderful to see such a broad uh, uh, representation of, of Russian teachers, um, not only in the United States, but I, I, I believe we have some from Russia uh, and uh, Great Britain on hand. Um, the, the, the sort of impetus for this webinar um, is really uh, uh, a means to um, assist the pre-college Russian teaching community. But of course, um, uh, any college university of Russian program uh, invests a lot of resources in uh, teaching students with no prior exposure to Russian. Uh, at any rate, um, this webinar is actually the first um, sort of step in uh, a project that both um, the uh, uh, Russian East European uh, Center at Pitt and um, Indiana University Russian and East European Institute, along with the assistance of the Slavic Eurasian Language Resource Center at North University of North Carolina are putting together. Um, we will uh, be uh, rolling out some um, activities, uh, lesson plans and the like this spring um, for high school teachers to um, take a look at, comment on, and we, we really hope pilot and get back up to us um, on your experiences. And um, those of you in the, um, in the uh, university college Russian teaching um, world, um, you're also welcome uh, to look at that. I'm gonna put in my, my email address here. If you wanna send me a message about that, um, we will, certainly keep you in the loop. So here we go.
Okay, that's me up there in the chat, Mark Trotter. Um, yeah, so thanks for, for, for taking time out um, to delay your weekend <laughs> uh, by, by joining our, our webinar. And thanks so much, uh, Olga and Isa. This, this was really one of the, one of the best uh, webinars that, that I've attended. Um, and uh, you're, you're both doing really, really, really fantastic, inspiring work. Um, so really, uh, hats off, kudos, and, and, and everything. Yevgeny, too, thank you for um, making the, uh, all of the technological arrangements and for um, giving us a slot in the ACTR web series. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark, for, for initiating this. And thank you, the ACTR. And for all the, the members of the ACTR and beyond for, for participating and trying to do our best <laughs> and to try to be better <laughs> at what we are doing every day, no matter what, right? <laughs> despite pandemic, etc. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you again. And uh, have a wonderful evening, everyone.